All right, we are back with your favorite podcast show of the week. This is Location Weekly. It's episode number 519. And as you can see on your screen, if you're watching this, uh, Aubriana is not here this week. And uh, we have, she's, uh, she's busy for, the, for this weekend next, uh, moving from Atlanta to uh, New York uh, to transition. And uh, so we'll have a couple of guest co-hosts uh, uh, starting this week with my good friend, Tim Hayden. Tim, welcome. How are you? Hey, Asif. Uh, I'm doing wonderful. And uh, just r- real quick, we just got to say congrats to Aubriana. This is a big move for her. Um, and having known her for several years, I'm just I'm, I'm proud for her and looking forward to what's next. Yeah, I, it, it is a it's a cool cool move for her. Obviously, a whole different experience being you know from Atlanta to New York. Um, you know, right. uh, but uh, you know she'll she'll handle it well. And I know uh, uh, Jerome, uh, her husband's got family uh, on that that part of the coast there in Definitely. Philadelphia. So um, I, I think uh, I think they'll be they'll transition well. It'll be a cool experience for their kids too. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So maybe before we jump into our uh, stories, we have four stories as per normal this uh, this week, but uh, maybe just a little bit of background for our uh, viewers and listeners, you know, on who you are and what you're up to these days. Absolutely. No, thank you. Uh, Brain Trust uh, consultancy that I started four years ago really is been out to and a lot of the things we're working on right now are helping companies deal with this rise in privacy legislation and even bigger than that i think a a bigger uh, transformation or game-changing thing that's happening is what's what's going on with the big tech platforms Um, ios 14 being one thing google deprecating the third-party cookie a number of things which we have some stories we'll talk about today that i think are related to all of the above but um Really, it's all about data. And um, some folks might wonder, what does this have to do with location data? What does this have to do with with LBMA? And it's it's really the the work that you and I have some sometimes working together or many times talking about in terms of engaging customers very relevantly where they are, wherever they may be, location being a thing. Um, location being the next cookie, right? You know, all these things over the years, my history being a mobile strategist um, and then a, a media intelligence guy is what's got me here. And um, it's it's, a, it's exciting times. It certainly is. It, yeah, exciting is one word. Uh, challenging might be another. Uh, it's constantly changing, that's for sure. So that's um, right. You know, the, it, there's never a dull moment in in the world that uh, that we live in over here at, at the LBMA and uh, in the world of, of media and advertising and and so on. So, uh, so why don't we we'll jump right into it? Um, you're filling in for Aubriana, so that means you get to uh, lead off with the first story uh, we've got this week, and so I'll throw it over to you. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we we're seeing Instagram do something right now. Um, they actually started it about uh, a little less than a year ago when they pushed reels out there for us to watch longer videos, uh, for us to spend more time. I think, I think we have to look at this. What, what Facebook is doing is, especially with the Instagram platform, is giving users reasons to stay focused with that app open longer. Um, and with that, the natural progression is commerce. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing happen, and this specifically with Drops, that's the new product, we'll call it a product, but a, a, a Drops is the new thing that Instagram is doing, is allowing the Instagram user to be the first to know when certain brands or certain products are being brought to market in, in a limited capacity for a short period of time, maybe at a, at a low price for a short period of time. And if you think about it, this is really just what we've seen with things like Indiegogo and Kickstarter. Um, this is what Groupon was, uh, you know, a decade plus ago. Um, this was, it's a natural consumer behavior to want to be able to get a deal before anybody else does, um, to get your hands on a product before your friends do. And it's, to me, it's just another spoke in the wheel of Facebook and Instagram to get you to spend more of your time, more of your attention with them. But it's the natural progression with Instagram to become a place of commerce, shopping. I mean, I'm, I'm curious to what you think about it. 
Yeah, I, I, I think it's a uh, it's a logical, natural progression for for Instagram uh, to get in this space. I know you know TikTok and Snapchat and and some of these others that they sort of compete more directly with are testing all sorts of things as well. So so I, I think. You know, I, I have to say, like, uh, from a personal point of view, like, I, I was late to, you know, the Instagram, you know, bandwagon. I'm still sort of, like, figuring that out. It's not natural for me. You know, Facebook made sense to see what's going on with friends and family. Twitter made sense for me as a as a business platform for sharing, you know, content and things. Sure. You know, I, I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. But these kind of, you know, th- like, I don't, I don't use TikTok. I don't use Snapchat. Um, but Instagram, I've kind of started to embrace and, and I will say this, like, you know, from an advertising point of view, I see a lot of ads on there that are quite relevant to me, you know, based on what I'm searching for or things. And and I have actually bought things, um, you know, because of ads I've seen on, on Instagram. So I, I can directly, you know, you know, sort of say that, that it works, it has influence on me, um. And so I think, you know, having a way to directly, you know, uh, participate and buy, you know, from within the platform in something like this, I think makes a ton of sense. And I, and I can see, uh, you know, uh, many sort of uh, brands playing around with this and experimenting. You know, I, 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 I'm always surprised that, I guess the last comment I have on this is that, um, you know, I know Apple experimented similarly with AirDrop itself, um, you know, at, at places like South by Southwest with exclusive sort of offers to people broadcasting nearby. And I I think there's, you know, there's room for that um, sort of location based element to be integrated into this where there's um, either you, you sell directly in an e-commerce environment, or you can also in some cases use it to drive traffic to a local experience or event or store or something like that. That's also exclusive. And I'd like to see some sort of combination of both. I think you're absolutely right. And just to put some punctuation on that, I think what you just said about Apple, right, is Apple's experimented with something similar in the past. And Apple is the one who's forcing a lot of the current change in the marketplace. Um, it, you know, releasing and, and launching Apple TV Plus last year as they did, and then quickly following with iOS 14. It's a one two punch to say, hey, Apple's users. Apple should have first rights or at least should protect them, they say, in privacy. But with them, I I think we're going to see Apple move in a very similar direction here. So this is this is posturing, if you ask me, between between Facebook and Apple Mm -hmm. to see who's who's going to get time spent watching, time spent listening, more of our attention. But how is that monetized in terms of commerce? How do they become e-tailers more than they already are? Um, because both of them have to look at Amazon. Both of them have to look at Walmart and they got a lot of catching up to do to be able to compete on those levels. There you go. All right. So check it out. Uh, if you're on Instagram, take a look at drops and, uh, yeah, let us know if, if you've played around with it or you bought something there or, um, you know, how it goes. Uh, We're always interested in kind of hearing from, from users out there as well. So, all right, on to our second story now. So uh, this is a, a bit of an acquisition story. Uh, so Nielsen IQ, uh, which is based in Chicago, uh, or sorry, ha- has acquired a Chicago-based company called Label Insight. Uh, and so this is a company that's focused on sort of product attribution data. Um, you know, it, it's a very interesting space right now because I think you know, if you look at Amazon and you look at sort of their, you know, sort of behemoth from a data analytics perspective and knowing everything about every product that's in the marketplace, you know, I I think when you look at the wider uh, ecosystem outside of Amazon, you know, in in sort of bricks and mortar retail, you know, shelves and grocery stores and all this kind of stuff, having, you know, detailed, robust data on, you know, what's the product, where, how's it sourced, you know, the ingredients in it, the health value in it, all, all this sort of stuff, you know, is incredibly important right now, because I think for, for two reasons. Uh, one is I think consumers are much more tuned in, much more interested, 
uh, and looking to understand, you know, what they're buying, where it's coming from, how it's manufactured, is it ethically sourced, is it, you know, environmentally sourced, you know, all these kinds of things are really important. And so having sort of the data tied to the products that are available for sale um, and, and pulling that sort of together into a robust platform uh, is really, you know, sort of what Nielsen IQ is after here. Uh, in adding to you know what they already you know have, which is a very very uh, large data set, um, right. so I think that's really interesting. And and I think the the other part for me that appeals uh, to this particular story is that knowing about the products is one thing, but you know how you can then take that and, and tie that into uh, commerce experiences through you know where we see the industry going right now, which is heavy into sort of AR and uh you know image based search uh, and those types of things so you know holding up my phone over the product and then having it you know relay that information and that data back to me powered by insights from a platform like this i think is is incredibly valuable as well and we know we've talked a lot on the show lately in the last number of months Ryan and i about you know sort of the you know acceleration of ar um uh, experiences and, and um activation so I, I see this as a really strong move for Nielsen IQ, and uh, would love your thoughts on that, Tim. You bet. No, I mean, I, I think it's it's interesting anytime Nielsen acquires a company, right? Because Nielsen, for the longest time, knew everything we did in our living rooms, or at least knew what we were watching on television, and um, and they did that, you know, with a with a certain sample size, and then made a judgment on the rest of us. I think as they've been able to widen the um, you know the intake of information that they have and insights that they have and flipping that this is this isn't about customers and people this is about products now this is this is what's interesting about it i acutely um, i have a business partner who's a, a type 1 diabetic i have a son who's got a peanut allergy and my wife this is a different podcast for a different time over the last month has taken our family through a sugar detox well what you're talking about there with AR, the ability to look at something and know if it has added sugar, to know uh, where it was sourced responsibly or not, if if that matters to me, but understanding its contents and its nutritional value, to understand um, what other ingredients may be there or substances. Um, and I mean that for other products too, in terms of plastics, things like that. Um, this this is all related in terms of of how we as consumers are building our own DNA in terms of what we consume or subscribe to. It becomes very unique to us. And as we have more information on the products that we buy and we subscribe to, um, we start to assort uh, our life that's almost very unique. It's kind of like what iTunes was a decade ago, right? In a pre pre-Apple Music, certainly pre-Spotify, pre-Pandora world, so probably a little bit more than 10 years ago, we you probably could sample 100 different folks around the world and not one of them would have the same iTunes or iPod playlist that they were using. Uh, and, and that same kind of thing is manifesting its way into the products we buy. Um, you know, and, and to do that, um, we prescribe what it is that's good for us. Sometimes a third party, a doctor, or someone's told us that, or we just know we feel better or we feel better about ourselves, two different things, by by knowing what's in a product. So I think there's a number of ways this this, this could play out. Um, I really like what you put out there in terms of augmented reality, in terms of being able from an image recognition standpoint to uh, give you uh, this specs, if you will, on something, not just how much it costs or where you could buy it, but what's inside it. That's fascinating to me. Yeah. And, and in some respect, if you can translate that into, you know, quick, actionable decisions, right? I think it becomes, you know, even more exciting. I know several years ago, um, you know, I was doing some work uh, with Mondelez and um, they, uh, you know, they had a sort of innovation program looking for startups, you know, to sort of bring, you know, interesting, you know, technology uh, to sort of apply to their business units, Oreo and so on. Right. And, um, you know, I know one of the things that was being looked at back, this was a few years ago, uh, is, you know, using image recognition to kind of scan that product 
and you know you through it through an app that they would provide and that app would know a lot about you and your allergies and and so on so you know you could quickly scan that product and it would just come back with a green check mark or a red x saying this one's okay for you or not um you know right based on you know what it what it would pick up and i think something that's very simple and you know as a consumer, if I don't have to go and read every ingredient on that on that product to determine whether it's got peanuts or nuts or anything from, you know, an allergy for my son, you know, you've just made that decision for me. Like that's pretty, pretty, you know, pretty powerful and pretty time saving and, and pretty Definitely. useful. Uh, I understand there's, you know, all kinds of liability associated with that too, right? So, right. Uh, you know, if I just automatically trust that check mark and, and, <laughs> and something happens. So, yeah. Well, and I don't know, you need to riff on it, but um, just what we were talking about with drops on Instagram um, and, and, and what you stated, because I, I feel the same way. I bought things through Instagram based on ads that were put in front of me that were very yeah. relevant. Well, what is Instagram doing in that situation? They're looking at our hashtags. They're looking at the locations we've tagged, but yeah. they're looking at the photos. They are doing exactly what we're talking about here with image recognition, computer vision, right? Yeah. What, what we're talking about here with with what Nielsen has the ability to do with ingredients, well, the ingredients of our life in terms of where we are, what the picture is of. If, if I have a lot of pictures of me fishing outdoors, then Orvis, all of a sudden, I've never bought anything from Orvis in my life. Yeah. But Orvis is is, is 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 targeting me now. And what Nielsen is doing now is saying, hey, let's dial that up a notch. Let's let's look at the ingredients. And I think we're talking about the functional ways that those of us with certain challenges, dietary needs, whatever else, there's there's that's the obvious thing. There's that hyper relevancy though that I think is there for Nielsen to be able to go back to brands and say, we know who will like your products based what's on inside it. Um, I think that's, um, that's a whole new level. Yeah. And if they can find a way to tie that to, you know, sort of like Nielsen's got, you know, couponing businesses and all sorts of other things right within their sort of ecosystem. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunities to sort of uh, reinvent some of those older parts of the, uh, the ecosystem there from a, a commerce, you know, bricks and mortar as well. So anyhow, very interesting. So, so moving from one IQ to another, uh, tell us about our next story. So, um, Intent IQ, who is in the business of identity resolution, which again is is a it's a space that I'm intimately familiar with because a lot of the hard work in adhering with privacy is being able to know where the data is and to being able to create what folks talk about as the golden customer record. Well, what they're doing right now is launching a new program at Intent IQ called the da data sharing choice, um, and basically. I think people are going to start to see pop-ups on certain websites that allow you, just as you do today in accepting cookies, but now being able to go a step further, agreeing to have not just your data, something that is used for cookies and content, but uh, data that you've shared with a website that can now be used with third parties to increase the personalization. Again, this all ties together. This is what we were talking about with the relevancy of, of Instagram ads, what Intent IQ is doing now is saying that if you visit various places on the web, let's enable those places to do this anonymously. I think here's the key part of this, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't include it, was it's not Tim Hayden that's sharing his information, but it is user XYA2X5 that has this unified record that is all of a sudden being shared by multiple third parties to increase the relevancy of the advertising or the media that I see. And it's that anonymous side of things, that anonymity that I think is important right now. This is, this is, this is bold right now. And I think, um, you know, if I have to form an opinion on it, this is right now being thrown out as we approach the crossroads on who owns the data. Is it, is it a third party? Is it the retailer? Is it a media entity? Or is it the consumer that owns that information? And I think Intent IQ is, is, is positioning themselves to become very relevant as a, as, a, as a means to reach the appropriate and ideal audiences as the cookie 
is deprecated, as the third-party cookie is no longer supported through Google and its many wares, and as iOS uh, continues to manifest itself into something that makes it more difficult for people to track a customer or, or better, let's not use track, but to reach a customer relevantly and timely through a mobile app or email or a web based on information coming from a, an iPhone or an iPad. So as they do that, I think Intent IQ finds themselves in a position, I, I think where they're going with this is to go back to any of the above, go back to the media entity, a relationship they have with the trade desk right now, who's capitalizing on this technology, on the data sharing choice, but also putting themselves in a position where they may have something of value that consumers would want to subscribe to, to be able to control their data or larger brands, larger data providers may want to uh, subscribe to that or 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 be able to integrate it into their systems as well. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, there's all sorts of, um, you know, people and, and companies trying to experiment right now and find a way to navigate around, you know, the iOS and, and IDFA deprecation, right? So I think you're gonna see all sorts of different models evolve. I, I think the one common theme that I see throughout all of it right now is that you know, um, the average consumer is much more aware of, you know, their data and the value of that data and, you know, the sort of desire to sort of protect that or if not protect that, participate in the monetization of their own data. Um, and, right. and so, you know, I, I think that, you know, for many of these things to be successful going forward, I think you're actually going to have to see some way for the consumer um, to share their data in a way that you know enables uh, personalized offers and brand relevance to them, but at the same time benefit from you know the sharing of that data if it's going to be used for you know you know other uh, you know sharing with other parties. So you know if I go and you know, benefit because Orvis, you know, is, is reaching out to me and I decide to go to, to do something there. Maybe that means I actually, you know, sort of get a discount on, you know, Orvis products, you know, for, because I'm allowing that, that data sharing to go on. Right. Right. Uh, or if Orvis is going to use that to, you know, you know, reach out to somebody else. The other thing I think that that's really interesting about this is that I think the other, the, the, the other sort of trend I'm starting to see is, larger publishers, let's call them, are going to create their own sort of proprietary IDs, I, I believe. That's true. Yes. Right? And, and you're, get, you're going to see a, a wave of these come. And not everybody's going to be able to do this because, you know, not everybody has scale. But, right, right. Um, you know, a Nielsen, you know, could get into this space. An Amazon could get into this space, you know, uh, and others, right? And, and I think you're going to start to see sort of a wave of these sort of, um, you know, sort of, private, you know, sort of uh, network IDs that are tied to individual publishers um, that are going to try and do their own thing. Um, the challenge is going to be how do you build scale around that? And right. maybe that means, you know, sort of a, a, a renaissance time, if you will, for looking at things, tying this back to things like coalition loyalty that, that you know, right. has been tried a thousand times in, in the US market and has failed. Um, right. You know, I, I know Amex tried plenty and a whole bunch of other programs over the years. But I actually think that that is, is, is one way to potentially sort of salvage something out of, you know, you know, what's going on right now in the privacy space, right? So right. I, I think coalition loyalty is, is a potential solution around this. I think the credit card companies, you know, have scale and, and can achieve something here. I think the telcos are going to start to play a much larger role in this space than they have in right. the past. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities here, but I do like what's going on with, with the DSC platform, the data, you know, data sharing choice as well. Um, but to me, it's all about scale, right? Like if you can't get right. scale on something like this, it, it's, it, it's really a non-starter, you know, no matter how elegant your approach is and, and how interesting, you know, sort of you, you go about the privacy and the technology around it. Um, if you don't have scales, it, it's kind of useless. 
I totally agree. And, I mean, and, and with that scale comes great responsibility, but great opportunity. And, and you, you didn't say the word outright, but this is where blockchain comes into in, into consideration, right? Is yeah. we're entering a phase where you can start to operate with anonymity and to have surety in terms of uh, who you're buying from, but also what you're buying, right? So I think um, there's, there is that debate that's out there on who's going to monetize on that information the most. Is it the consumer? There's a rising movement of both collective groups and individuals and even some things happening legislatively that may enable the consumer to have more control in the name of consumer protection. Um, I think when we talk about the legislative front of it, but the, the end game here is the distributed network. And when you talk about coalitions, um, it makes me think about uh, things that I've seen in Austin, Texas, where I live, the go local card that we used to carry with us, right? That would have two or 300 small businesses that I got a discount for carrying a little piece of plastic that had a magnetic strip on it that I could swipe. And those two or 300 small businesses that got me a discount. Yeah. Um, so, you know, back then nobody was thinking about blockchain, but that was, that was what it was about at the time was to say, we know, we know your behavior, which is what, where you're going with credit cards. And I, I would say banks are in the same position with debit cards, right? They, they have some of the richest data out there. They not only know the location of where you used it, but where you used it and what, what you had in your cart when you, when you used it, right? Um, they have ways of, of knowing some of that and ways that they don't have yet to, to get their hands on that information. But what do they do with it? And, and this move by the, the, data, the data sharing choice platform or program itself from Intent IQ is, is just one of those things we should keep an eye on because it's, it's going to play right alongside all these other players who are trying to say, hey, we know the people that use us best and and we would like third parties we'd like to offer some way for third parties to to leverage us to be able to reach our users um that's that's the end game no doubt about it and it of course it's all a precursor to that distributed ledger that that blockchain world that i think is only you know five to eight ten years out uh, max um not cryptocurrency here i want everybody to be clear we're not talking about bitcoin we're talking about value transfers within Amazon, within the retailers we go to, or maybe within our communities and, and allowing them to join forces. Um, what Intent IQ is doing here is allowing third parties, um, strange bed partners, we could say, to share information, to be able to target the same group of people, the same persons with promotions and offers. There you go. Um... Yeah, no, I, I think there's there's so much potential there. And I think I'm glad you brought up the blockchain piece, because I, I think that it's really in its infancy around this. And, you know, I can I can say from, you know, my world at ground level and kind of some of the stuff we're doing right now in Canada around healthcare. I mean, a lot of the conversation these days is about, you know, the role blockchain is going to play in vaccine passports and all sorts of things right now. So uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's nothing to do with cryptocurrency. It's all about, you know, right. sort of, you know, security and scale and, and anonymity and, and protection. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I think there's, there's a ton of opportunity there as well. All right, uh, on to our final um, segment here, which is we just wanted to kind of um, share the news about uh, two uh, two investment stories that uh, that have happened uh, lately um, within our industry. So the first is um, a company called Simple View uh, has uh, invested in another company called Stroll, and Stroll is a location based marketing platform in the travel um, uh, industry, based out of Nashville, Tennessee. And, uh, you know, I, I found this kind of interesting because uh, and the reason I kind of wanted to bring it forward is, is it, you know, when when you look at the travel and tourism sector right now, it's probably, if not the hardest hit, you know, right up there in top three. Right. You know, with the restaurant industry and, and whatnot, uh, you know, coming out of COVID. And so I think. The one thing we've learned at ground level, you know, with our platform and we do a lot of work in, in this sector as well is this is an industry that's hurting and one way out of that um you know that can help uh, alleviate some of that pain as you start to plan a recovery is to look at data 
and look at ways to uh, to reach out to people that are either looking to travel or looking to, to visit places um, to find other businesses that are complementary, you know, to those businesses and find partnerships and cross promotional opportunities and these right. kinds of things. So I think, you know, uh, niche players like this, like Stroll, I think play a huge role in, in sort of, you know, helping, um, economic development, helping local tourist, uh, you know, bureaus and destinations, you know, really start to promote themselves. The other thing that I think is, is interesting too is, and we've seen this certainly up here in, in Canada, is the governments are handing out money like hand over fist right now to get the economy moving. Uh, right. and, and, and especially in this particular sector, there's a lot of money to help, you know, local municipal governments and, you know, local uh, small town, you know, chambers of commerce and, you know, whatnot to try and bring people back to get foot traffic back out and moving. Uh, and, you know, I think this year, this summer in particular, you know, between our two countries, the border is still closed. You know, a lot of that tourism is going to be happening domestically. Um, right. And so finding, discovering, you know, local, you know, and, and and other towns that maybe are a state away or two states away from you that you've, you know, never had a, a thought of going to because, you know, your European vacation is not happening this year or whatever. Right. So, um, you know, I, I think the timing is really good for, for an investment like this. I don't know a lot about Simple View. I can't can't speak to them specifically, but certainly Stroll is, uh, is, has been an interesting player that uh, I, I had come across before. So, uh, you know, just, just an interesting little investment there. So uh, take a look at Stroll, Nashville, Tennessee-based, uh, location-based company. Any quick thoughts on that one, Tim? Well, I've, uh, you know, I've over the last five or six years, I think maybe even longer than that, um, I've had the opportunity to go out and speak at uh, DMA West, um, the uh, symposium on social media for tourism, um, the Turks and Caicos Social Business Summit, right? Um, yeah. All, all of them um, have been working with destination marketing organizations, convention and visitors bureaus, and all of them for a long time, I think, have, have really been trying to figure out Simple View being one of the great enablers to help them make sense of the information they have with big groups, um, the the conferences and conventions that come to town, as well as the casual tourist, um, and I, I think this is um, this is something that Simple View must do. Um, they've they've got to become more relevant um, and more finite in terms of the utility that they can provide to travelers in terms of uh, getting them to open their wallets and and make a travel decision or even better to go see and do things while they're while they're on property or they're in the market right yeah. so i think i think you'll i think this is a move with with stroll to do that i think at the end of the day it's something you and i've talked about for for a long time though is the user experience right um, has got to be seamless uh, uh we can't expect people when they when they land at your airport to download a mobile app to wayfind their way around around town um, they're, they're not going to do that. They're probably going to ask the, the concierge. They're going to ask the bartender um, where they should go next, or they'll, they'll invest in a tour guide of some kind. Um, and that's, that's been the last mile for a lot of folks in that space is at what point does it become something that's digital and utilitarian with a mobile app or just a website as, as bandwidth improves as well. So this is, this is going to be an interesting play for, uh, for, for simple view and the DMOs they serve, no doubt. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, like, again, speaking from our side, like we, we're working with hundreds of BIAs and chambers and, and local, you know, uh, tourist destination groups up here. So I, I totally see this. I, I, I think there's a massive opportunity, that, yeah, at least the next year, if not, you know, two or three, uh, as uh, this industry needs to get rebuilt from from the bottom up. So uh, I, I Definitely. think the smart move. Uh, the last um, story we want to mention is uh, a big time LBMA uh, member company uh, here called Beamray, uh, Finnish based company actually, uh, has been acquired by Verve Group, another uh, LBMA uh, member company. So uh, interesting uh, when members come together uh, in, in that way. 
Um, if you're not familiar with Beam Ray, you know, sort of a player that, uh, you know, really specialized early on in, in beacons and, and yeah, that, uh, you know, sort of data collection and hyper personalization uh, in Europe uh, primarily uh, had a big presence in the Spanish market um, uh, as well. And, uh, you know, lately has kind of really pivoted to sort of privacy and sort of AI based insights derived from that data. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is a, it's a, it's a good move for Verve and, and, you know, sort of their parent company, MGI, um, you know, they've been on sort of a bit of an acquisition tear for the last number of years. Uh, you know, they bought, uh, Nexstar and, uh, on the video side, uh, right. and, and, you know, been buying up companies kind of left, right and center, uh, in and around the location, uh, ecosystem. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, a smart move. Like, congrats to to Rami and uh, and Rahman uh, over there. Uh, you know, they've been at it for a, a, a long time now, really working really hard, and uh, really excited for for them. Um, you know that this this has happened. So, uh, you know, don't have a ton more to say about it. But um, and I don't don't have any financial terms on it. But uh, I I think it's a uh, it, it's a it's a good move for Beamray, and I think it's uh, it really strengthens the Verve uh, portfolio. Definitely, um, you know, and and I think Beamray coming from uh, Europe, coming from Finland, even um, Scandinavia, where many would argue uh, the the privacy movement started, right? Uh, uh, digital suicide, as as they called it, way back when. Um, I think the 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 combination of the two here, um, the 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 larger. Uh, entities that Verve is is associated with and and linked to, uh, I think Beamray has got a huge opportunity to grow within that ecosystem, and um, and to do so responsibly. Uh, as I started out, you know, is um, you know they use the word uh, or the phrase privacy first a lot in the press release for this announcement, yeah. and um, because that's the only way you could do something like this is you had to you had to come right out of the gate and say hey we. We give you every opportunity to opt out, um, to not be tracked, as you're as you're doing this. But here's all the good, fantastic things we can do uh, as as responsible stewards of your data. I'm um, I'm excited for the guys at Beamray, and this is uh, this should be a, a wonderful growth opportunity for them, um, intercontinentally for sure. Yeah, yeah, and and just to kind of relate one last point on that, uh, more from the Verve side, not specific to the acquisition, but um, you know, on the privacy front, you know, I know Verve uh, announced a platform uh, maybe a few weeks ago called Atom, which is a sort of right. reading by cohort uh, for iOS. Right. Um, so you know, take a look at that as well. If uh, you know, if, you know, for anybody who's listening out there, uh, check out. Uh, it's called I think it's called Atom A T O M. Um, so it's a cohort tar targeting platform. So again, really, you know, I could see potentially Beamray's data playing into that uh, as well. So, so that's it. All right, that's the show. Um, <laughs> you know, four interesting uh, you know stories. Well, five really there. And uh, a whole wide array of stuff. Tim, thank you so much for uh, for taking time to kind of jump in and fill uh, Aubriana's uh, shoes. You, you know, you Absolutely. don't have kind of you know the the amazing hair and and all that that she brings you know every week. But uh, you know, it's uh, you know it's it's always good to see you, and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to fill in. You got it, Asif. I know. I, I'm always always a pleasure and and a, a treat. To, to riff on these kinds of, of topics and announcements that are out there. They happen every week. It's the reason we all listen. And I, I just feel fortunate to be on the show with you today and be, be part of the message and, and part of sharing everything that we did today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great to have you. And we'll, we'll do it again sometime, I'm sure. Uh, but Absolutely. Uh, have a good week. And, and to our listeners and, uh, and viewers out there, you've been listening to episode number 519 of Location Weekly. We thank you for your time. Please give us uh, some feedback uh, on whatever platform you're consuming this on. Um, and uh, if you have story ideas, reach out to us uh, on social media or you know, send us an email. We're, we're easily found. Uh, on all the platforms. So thanks everybody. Have a great week. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week and uh, we'll have another guest co-host for you next week. So take care. Bye. Adios. Mm -hmm.